Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 68 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Before we get started with another awesome interview, it's time for me to let you know about a sweet deal just for you from Skillshare, because learning is pretty much my favorite thing. Skillshare has over 20,000 classes to take online, so you can keep yourself busy learning everything from drawing to writing to how to become more productive. Their classes are offered as videos and Zoom workshops, and if you're feeling social, you can join groups to help keep you learning and keep you motivated. Sound good? Why not check it out? Friends of the Medieval Podcast can try Skillshare out for free for two whole months. Find out what sort of learning is waiting for you at medievalist.net slash Skillshare. A lot has been written and produced about the Wars of the Roses in recent years, with a whole bunch of fresh ink spilled about the women involved in the bloody fight for the English throne. Everyone seems to love the end of the story too, with the mysteries around Richard III and the rise of the Tudors. And a few weeks ago on the podcast, Emma Levitt and I talked about the Yorkist king, Edward IV, and how he used jousting to further his cause. But in this colorful and vast cast of characters, there's one who always seems to be set out of the limelight, despite being the very epicenter of the conflict. One who today's guest aptly calls a shadow king, Henry VI. Today I'm speaking with Lauren Johnson, a historian, writer, and heritage interpreter who has spent many years digging into the Wars of the Roses and their aftermath. She's the author of So Great a Prince, England and the Accession of Henry VIII, as well as a novel called Arrow of Sherwood. But for this episode, we're talking about Lauren's latest book, Shadow King, The Life and Death of Henry VI. Here's our conversation on the somewhat forgotten King Henry, his life, his illness, and his quiet but important legacy. Well, thanks, Lauren, for joining me to talk about Henry VI. It is great to talk to you. I really enjoyed the book, and uh, I'm excited to get talking about Henry VI. Thanks for having me. How did you get interested in Henry VI? Because he's one of these kings that doesn't get a lot of attention. So how did he draw your attention? Yeah, he gets almost no attention, actually. There hasn't been a, a kind of proper big biography of him since the 80s, really. And the way I found him, funnily enough, was through his wife, Margaret of Anjou, who um, is someone I had looked at in the past. I've done a fair bit of work on 15th century women. And initially, I kind of wanted to tell her story, but she has had a lot more attention in recent years. And I felt like, well, you can't tell her story without his. So can you tell his story without her? Well, maybe not. You know, what's what's missing here? And I, the more I looked at Henry point of view, just as kind of telling both stories together, the more I felt like he had been misunderstood. Because here is a king whose life touches on a lot of things that I think actually are very interesting and relevant today. The, the most important of which to me is mental health. He's remembered as being a mad king. I'm using inverted commas in the air. <laughs> Little air quotes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's remembered for having a, a very... I mean, catastrophic, really, mental collapse when he was in his early 30s, which effectively sort of helped pave the way for the Wars of the Roses between his Lancastrian dynasty, the Red Rose, and his relation, Richard Duke of York's dynasty, the White Rose of York. So that's a really important part of his story, but it was consistently not being told right. I felt like there was lots of fobbing him off as like, oh, he was just mad. And we know, don't we? We know today that's never the full story. There's always so much complexity and it's about the situation that you find yourself in. So I wanted to understand the man behind that, basically. Which I think is a, a very noble goal, because as you say, people kind of shunt him off to the side, as they did with his grandfather, who also had mental health issues. So let's just start at the beginning. Who is Henry VI? There's lots of Henrys. <laughs> Which one is Henry VI? Yeah. Well, he's the one no one's heard of. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. <First> of all. <laughs> Yeah, he's the son of Henry V, who's much more famous from Shakespeare in particular. Uh, He's the king who won the Battle of Agincourt in the Hundred Years' War. And the one thing Henry V did not succeed in was having an adult son take over from him. Because when Henry V died while on campaign, still in France, still fighting the Hundred Years' War, his son became Henry VI, and he was only nine months old 
So immediately that causes a lot of issues for little Henry because he basically grows up to become king, having firstly never known anything except being king, which makes you a bit weird. And secondly, having never seen kingship in action, having never learnt from a father figure or anyone around him how to do the job of kingship, which I think kind of paved the way for a lot of the problems that he had later in life. And as I say, he is a quite unfortunate figure, as well as dealing with the Wars of the Roses, bloody civil war that eventually took his life in 1471. He died as a prisoner of his enemies in the Tower of London. Uh, he also lost the Hundred Years' War. So, I mean, this is not a successful king by any stretch of the imagination. So he comes to the throne at nine months old and he's always, you know, even before he has his mental break, whatever we are going to choose to call it for our discussion, even as a young man, as a young king, he's not very decisive. He's a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> so how does this yeah. kind of shape the country <laughs> to begin with? I know. It's one of the things that's saddest about Henry's story, I think, is that right from the beginning, he seems like such a sort of loving, peaceful, kind-hearted, generous person. It's just that he doesn't combine that with kind of political savvy, I suppose. He's very well educated. He's very intellectual. He's very interested in education. He founds Eton College and King's College, Cambridge, two very famous educational establishments that still exist today, 600 years later. But he just he kind of just wants everyone to get along, really. And in a, a period in which there's already been almost a century of warfare between England and between France, that's just not going to happen. It's going to be messy and complicated. And the fact that Henry pursues this policy of trying to make peace with France rather than trying to fight the war with France, that causes a lot of problems and a lot of sense among the English people that he isn't really putting as much into the job of kingship as he should. Yeah, and we haven't really mentioned so far, but he is supposed to be the bridge that's building to bring England and France together because he's brought the two houses together. So even as a nine-month-old, he's supposed to be the king of both England and France. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, he's the son of Henry V, king of England, and of Catherine Valois, who's the princess of France. And that means that he inherits both claims. So he inherits the, the right to the Kingdom of England and of France. And in fact, his grandfather, Charles VI of France, dies almost immediately after Henry V. So before he's one year old, he is already King of England and France. And what I like, this is one of my top Trump's facts about Henry. <laughs> uh, loads of medieval kings and, and queens claim to have been, you know, the King of England and of France. But Henry VI is the only one who actually is King of both places. He is crowned in Paris as a child. So he really did. He, he did succeed in being crowned. He just didn't succeed in actually holding on to any territory there. <laughs> and you get at, in the book that it could be partly losing his last holds in France that that lead him into a catatonic state. So what happened that that possibly was a, a trigger maybe that led him into this catatonic state? Yeah, the war with France had not been going well in general, really. And I think actually Henry V probably would, if he had survived, he would have changed his policy and gone towards peace himself at some point. But the trouble is, is that Henry's peace policy, Henry VI, was so unsuccessful that sort of bit by bit, pieces of France started to be lost as he got older and he moved into adult rule. So in 1450, he loses all of Normandy and northern France, which is hugely important to the English. There's a real, you know, think of the Norman conquest. There's this real sense of history to those territories. And that leads to a huge rebellion in England. A number of Henry's chief advisors are assassinated. So a really difficult, traumatic experience for Henry to go through when he's nearly 30 at that point. For the first time in his life, really to face losing his kingdom and potentially losing the English kingdom to these rebels. And then three years later, he loses everything else. <laughs> yeah. uh, so all of the southern French territories go as well. And we're not completely certain, but it seems like there is a coincidence between the news arriving from France of the loss of these territories and Henry suffering what at the time is called a frenzy. He is suddenly smitten with a frenzy and his wit and reason withdrawn. Now, if there was any kind of frenzy, which we would think of today as being active and you know manic, maybe, that doesn't seem to be there for the whole of the rest of the period of his illness, which lasts about 16 months. Although, again, the sources are really tricky for this period and very patchy, so we can't be completely sure. 
But as far as we can see, he is described as being, as you said, catatonic. He's not moving. He's not talking. He's not reacting to people around him when they're talking to him. His son, his only child, is born two months into his illness and brought to him. And even that doesn't trigger any sort of response from him. And there's been a real assumption with Henry that maybe this was the result of schizophrenia, particularly schizophrenia inherited through his mother's line from previous rulers of France, which I don't entirely agree with personally. I think that actually it's it's not that Henry suffers a mental collapse and therefore there are problems in the kingdom. I think it's that he has dealt with an enormous amount of stress and anxiety and trauma in his life up to this point. And that in 1453, he just can't hold it together anymore. And I think we would say today it's it is, yeah, a psychological break, but I think maybe it's triggered by depression of an extreme form. And I think that probably throughout the rest of his life, there are incidents where depression really takes over for him. Yeah. And if for somebody, so I'm thinking as you're talking that for somebody who is as religious as Henry is, this has got to be really difficult, all of the things that he is facing. I think about Richard II having kind of the same problem where, you know, I'm king and if I'm not king, who am I? And the same problem possibly being a factor in, in Henry VI, because if he's losing his kingdom, is he still a king? Do you think that, I mean, it's it's hard to get you to speculate about this kind of thing, but do you think that this factor of kind of identity and religion might have had something to do with it? Yeah, I do. And I think you're completely right about the importance of religion to him. I think he really felt the bloodshed that was happening in his name on both sides of the channel in the end. I think he was deeply concerned about the shedding of Christian blood, as as he put it, and wanted to do what none of his forebears had do. It was actually a really ambitious scheme to try and end the Hundred Years' War. You know, none of the previous kings had managed it for a century. What's interesting, though, is skipping ahead a little bit, in 1461, once the Wars of the Roses have broken out and Henry has faced real challenges from the Yorkist dynasty, he is driven from his throne. So he loses completely, just as you say, he loses any identity of kingship at that point. And what is interesting is he doesn't really try and regain his kingdom. The person who is regaining England for him is Margaret, his wife, and she is doing it sort of allegedly for Henry, but really more for their son, who is growing up into adolescence by this point. So I think as much as Henry was absolutely defined by kingship, as much as he felt the duty of it, I think it was quite an unwelcome burden to him later in life. Yeah, and maybe earlier too. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, seem maybe too... his entire life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a really interesting time because you would think that he has a live son, he has Prince Edward, and you would think that this would make everything more stable, but it happens to come at a time, Henry's instability, just as a ruler, happens to come at a time when the House of York is really powerful. <laughs> so how how does this start, the Wars of the Roses, when you have, well, Margaret of Anjou is in there as well, but I will let you explain it how you like, how does this begin my impression of it, and I have to say that like, I am a bit biased because I've spent a lot of time with Henry and I feel very protective of him now because like, <laughs> no one else does. <laughs> no right. one else cares about Henry VI. <laughs> I feel that effectively what happened is, like I said, in 1450, there was a big rebellion against Henry. And during the course of that, one of his relatives, Richard, Duke of York, was sort of invoked by the rebels not for having been involved in the rebellion, but as a, a person who could come and maybe take control of government and make things right. And Richard, Duke of York, did indeed return to England. He'd been serving in Ireland up until that point and kind of push Henry to try and make him his, his chief governor, basically. And Henry said no. And that's really interesting to me because Henry was still capable then of of sort of defying people who are trying to force him into things. But the trouble is, is York wouldn't take that for an answer. He, he absolutely had a right as a senior prince of the royal blood, effectively, to be a very important member of Henry's government. It's just there was something between the two of them. There was some personality clash or something. We know today in politics, like, personalities matter. If you can't work with someone, then you're not going to want to, to be in league with them. And I think it was that for Henry and York. There was something fundamental there. They could just not agree. And as more time went on, York, who was a warrior, who was experienced in military matters, tried to find a military solution to this by fighting Henry. And Henry, still the peacemaker, kept trying to make peace and make peace. 
to the extent that ultimately Margaret herself is having to sort of step in and command armies for him because he's not really wishing to do so. So I think there's just this absolute clash of characters that throughout the 1450s leads to a complete fracturing of the political realm in England. And because Henry is not the sort of king who can impose himself on anyone else, he can't resolve the problem. Like literally his solution to the impending Wars of the Roses is to make all of the opposing factions, some of whom have been, you know, their fathers have been murdered by their enemies at this point. He makes them walk through the streets of London holding hands. Like, and he <laughs> thinks that will resolve it. Like <laughs> this is a person of extreme optimism. Um, and funnily enough, it doesn't work. And ultimately again, Battles break out. York himself is killed, in fact, in battle just before he can kind of take the throne from Henry. And as I say, ultimately, that leads to Henry having to rely on Margaret, really, to fight his campaigns. Yeah, I just think that moment is the love day, right? <laughs> love day yeah. kind of parade. Love day. Oh, my gosh. It's just it's so sweet and optimistic, as you say, and it's just not going to work at all. But everybody kind of goes along with it while they're still plotting while holding their hand the hand of their enemies it's just yeah the fact that henry can't keep control of the situation is evident in the fact that you've got these two sides sort of lined up against each other it couldn't be more clearly saying who, which factions don't like each other and at the head of them is the duke of york holding hands with margaret of anjou and the fact that a king in the 15th century, a king can't even kind of, as it would be seen then, control his wife and her political leanings, that's a serious issue. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say, they don't have the benefit of hindsight, but still, there's got to be a tension in London that day that you could just cut with a knife. Yeah. And I think that it's this rivalry with York that really gets Margaret of Anjou upset. And he's just, she's not really powerful before she marries Henry, but she has this idea of... She knows what her role is, what his role is. And the fact that York is challenging him is a terrible idea. And then later, Henry actually disinherits his own son in favor of York. And I can just imagine Margaret just losing it at that point. So how does that happen? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's a very sort of complex moment in history, really. The one thing I would say is that Margaret of Anjou, when she arrives in England and marries Henry in 1445, she's only 15. Henry's 23. And for, it takes a really long time for her to emerge as a political figure in her own right. For a long time, she is trying, exactly as you say, to be the queen, for Henry to be the powerful king, to fulfill that role that's expected of her. And it just, she can't because Henry is not the king that England needs at that time. So Margaret sort of has to be the king while also being the queen, which is, you know, very confusing for her. As we get to the end of the 1450s and the Wars of the Roses really has, has broken out, the Yorkists manage to grab hold of Henry himself while uh, Margaret is trying to, you know, raise an army up in the north of England to, to try and regain the kingdom for him. And I think it's really clear that Margaret's influence by that point is what is holding Henry together and, and holding up his resolve. Because without her, as you say, he gives in. He just gives in to York's demands and says, all right, yes, you can disinherit my son. It is extraordinary. And I think it, it just goes to show how much Henry had been reduced by that point, by the, the tensions of, well, his entire life, but particularly the decade before. Yeah. And it's actually, as you said, it's it's Margaret that takes up the cause that keeps that going when Henry's on the run. Eventually, they lose completely and Henry is in hiding and Margaret goes off. And what does she do to try and to take England back? And, well, everything. everything. And it, there's this whole forgotten chapter, I feel, of Henry and of Margaret's lives from 1461 when Henry is deposed to 1470 when remarkably Margaret manages to get him put back on the throne very briefly. And it's a period of history that just seems to get skated over in most histories of the Wars of the Roses. People go, oh, yeah, Henry was gone and we'll just ignore that. But actually what's happening is, is he is hiding out in Scotland, sort of trying to maintain a presence in the British Isles, effectively, while Margaret goes over to France, to Burgundy, which traditionally are their enemies. She disguises herself as a peasant woman at one point to get through enemy territory in order to meet with the Duke of Burgundy. She's sending out ambassadors across 
all of Europe, really, anyone who is vaguely related to the Lancastrian dynasty, she gets in touch with to try and coordinate this huge invasion, effectively, of multiple different countries in support of Henry's claim, while also she seems to have a, a cell of spies and people, agents in England who are inciting rebellion against the Yorkist regime. So she is just uh, like a, a spider at a vast web of intrigue throughout this period. And Henry's just hanging out first in Scotland, then in Northumberland. For a year, he disappears. We literally have no idea where he is. Like, <laughs> he just is somewhere in England being hunted down. And then the, the last five years before Margaret manages to restore him, he is actually a captive of the Yorkists. He's taken captive and held in the Tower of London. And even that doesn't stop Margaret. She's still pushing for him to be restored to the throne. Yeah, one of the things I think is kind of remarkable about the Wars of the Roses is how kind, and this is kind of also in air quotes as well, Edward IV is towards his enemies. Like he's a whole other giant book and podcasts and things like that. But he allows Henry to live in the tower for, as you say, quite a long time and treats him pretty well, considering all things considered. So what is the feeling in England at this point where they are, are they okay with having a captured king in the tower? Because it does last for quite a long time. What do you think the feeling is in England? I think there's still an enormous amount of affection for Henry, which I think is why Edward IV, York's son, who becomes the Yorkist king in 1461, I think that's why he behaves as he does. I would also say, it's, I don't think it's entirely kindness on Edward's part. I think he realises that Henry VI is a completely rubbish leader of the Lancastrian cause. And as long as he is the one who would have to be put back on the throne for the Lancastrians to be successful, then really it doesn't, you know, Edward can keep him alive. Henry's a pathetic king. It doesn't really matter. The trouble comes as Henry's son, who is very confusingly, as everyone in the 15th century has the same name, is also called Edward. <laughs> I'll just call him the Prince of Lancaster for, <laughs> for simplicity. Um, Henry's son, the Prince of Lancaster, is growing up to be much more of a military figure. He talks about chopping off heads. He loves riding. He's obviously very involved in kind of martial pursuits. And that is much more of an issue for Edward IV. So as long as Edward IV keeps Henry VI alive, he doesn't really have to worry about Henry VI's son. The trouble is in 1470, this little Prince of Lancaster is, you know, he's in his late teens. He's old enough now to actually fight Edward IV in a battle. And that is much more of a threat. So Edward deals with him quite brutally. He is killed in battle at Tewkesbury in 1471. And I think we can see a real change in Edward IV from that point. From then on, I mean, it's just like wipe out all the Lancastrians, drag them out of sanctuary if they've claimed it, like try and kill them in the church, whatever it takes. And it's during that very messy period when Henry has sort of sort of been put back on the throne, but Edward IV is still there leading an army. It's during that period that Edward IV conclusively crushes the Lancastrian cause by killing the Prince of Lancaster in battle, by defeating various other armies for the Lancastrian cause, and I would argue by killing Henry VI himself in yeah. the Tower of London. Yeah, as you've said in the book, the propaganda is that Henry dies of a broken heart in the Tower <laughs> the very mm -hmm. night that Edward comes back successful from beating the Lancastrians again. What do you think happened? You have some ideas in here based on some archaeology. What do you think happened to Henry? I just don't think there's any chance at all that he died of sadness. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite a rubbish excuse. I can see that because obviously there was an awareness by this point that Henry had mental troubles, that maybe the fact that Edward lets it be put out, that Henry dies of pure displeasure and melancholy, and melancholy having a bit of a you know depression element to it, maybe there's that implication there. But the fact that the Walkworth Chronicle, within a matter of years, is describing how Henry's body, when it was taken from the tower to be buried, was seen to bleed on the streets as it was carried. The fact that, in fact, even possibly before the Walkworth Chronicle writes that, in the sort of mid-1470s, already a cult has started to de develop around the late King Henry VI, which believes that he was murdered and that he was therefore a saint and that he can intercede for people to create miracles. To the extent that even, in fact, at one particular shrine near Reading, there was a dagger, which allegedly was the dagger that had stabbed to death King Henry VI, which was a holy relic. I think the fact all of those things emerge so quickly is, to me, quite clear evidence, I think, that 
that Henry was killed and that Edward IV was behind it. And I think people at the time were very clear on that. Subsequently, many hundreds of years later, in the early 20th century, Henry VI's body was exhumed, but it wasn't, it wasn't tested for blood traces. It, wasn't, uh, it was decided by the anatomist who looked at the bones that actually you couldn't really tell enough from them. We know that there are many different wounds that you could make or injuries you could inflict on someone without you know, those showing on the bones. So it is entirely possible, for instance, that if you stabbed someone, they, unless it hits a bone, it's, you're not going to find any evidence of that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty clear that he was murdered. <laughs> I think that, uh, like you've said, that everyone's pretty clear on that because yeah, <laughs> he didn't he didn't even wait didn't wait at all. You've said that there's there is some gossip going around that Richard the Third was in the tower that night, <laughs> but it probably yes. wasn't Richard that either did this deed or really ordered it at all. No, it's Edward the Fourth is responsible for it fundamentally. What's interesting, so it's the Walkworth Chronicle again, so called Walkworth Chronicle written in the late 1470s. So before Richard III has, you know, taken the throne from the princes in the tower, before any of that sort of myth-making comes on the scene, who says quite pointedly that there were many people in the tower the night of Henry's death, but the only one he bothers to name is Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who is the younger brother of Edward IV. And it's interesting he chooses to do that at such an early point. And I, I wonder if it's because Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was constable of England at that time. So he was the man responsible for the carrying out of justice. We know that he presided over the executions of Lancastrians after the Battle of Tewkesbury. So maybe he was associated in people's minds with sort of being that sort of the instrument of justice, I suppose we would say. Maybe that's part of it. But yeah, like, if anyone is responsible for Henry's death, it is Edward IV. Which makes a whole lot of sense. And the part that's always heartbreaking for me when I come across this is the fact that it's not the same moment, but when when Edward takes Henry into his custody, Henry embraces him and says, oh, I know I'm going to be safe with you. I'm so glad it's you. And it's just like, what a moment. <laughs> what a moment. Yes, optimist till the end. <laughs> and I think there's so many moments like that in Henry's life where he's paraded in front of people, he's taken to a battle, but he's put it to the side. And then whoever wins goes and picks him up and he's just... <laughs> kind of sitting there waiting for them to pick him up and it's just it's it's I always feel pity when I think about Henry VI just because yeah. it's not that he had mental illness it's that he can't escape his kingship in the midst of having mental illness so oh my gosh poor Henry <laughs> yeah and I think there's a huge amount of sympathy for him at the time like there's nothing else really that would explain why it takes so long for him to lose his crown. You know, it takes 11 years from that first rebellion in 1450, from the first time York's name is sort of revived as this champion of the Commonwealth. 11 years, like how is that possible when he has already proven to be a failure really as a king? And I think the only possible explanation is that people liked Henry, that they didn't want to take his crown from him. They were willing, of course, to take it from his son. Hence, <laughs> we get the whole strange situation where Henry disinherits his son. And yeah, and I think that makes sense as well of why he becomes a saint later. He's seen as someone who people can relate to and appeal to in their hour of need. And that's really likable, I think. Yeah, I think that is a good word for him. He's very likable. Do you think that this love for Henry from the people comes from nostalgia from his father? Or do you think it comes from the fact that he seems to just be a really harmless individual? I think it is him. I don't think it is nostalgia for Henry V because he, Henry VI is never associated in people's sort of popular memory or imagination with the things that Henry V does. He is remembered for the things that he did himself. He's remembered as a peacemaker and someone who cared about children and the education of children who wanted essentially to have to give his subjects the best that he could. And I always say the big tragedy of Henry is that there is someone who had such good intentions who just couldn't fulfill them because he wasn't an extraordinary person. And that's what was needed at this point in history. He wasn't an extraordinary person. <laughs> that's, I'm yeah. just thinking about that. And, but no, you're right, because it's one thing to be an ordinary person in your regular life. But when you are the king of England and France, it's the time to be an extraordinary person, especially at the end of the Hundred Years' War. So we... Yeah. We haven't mentioned what happens to Margaret. What happens to Margaret in the end? Well, after 1471, when her son 
has been killed in battle. Her husband has been killed in the tower. She remains a prisoner for a number of years in England. And then in 1475, she's handed back over to her cousin, effectively to, to live as his prisoner, really. She's living in quite reduced circumstances in a little manor near the River Loire. And she has quite a pathetic end as well, I think, because she, she obviously just completely retreats from the real world. She is described as of having interest in hunting still and hunting dogs and in reading and relics, but, but nothing else. And Louis XI of France, her cousin, even goes so far as to like take her hunting dogs after she's died, which she has tried to leave to another person, a friend of hers who lives locally. And it's like, even in death, you know, Henry and Margaret are still being used by other people. Yeah. <laughs> I think that once Margaret has fulfilled her duty as queen, I think that there's probably, there's probably a quite amount of sadness that she's feeling, but also she's fulfilled her function. There's nothing left for her to do. She's lost her son and heir, which I think arguably is the person she's been fighting for even more than Henry yeah. throughout. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's the end. So let's not leave it there though. What do you think are some of the great legacies or the things that we should be remembering Henry for? So not just his contemporaries, but what should we be remembering Henry for? Well, I think whatever you feel <laughs> about the public school system, and I have many opinions, um, I think it is a remarkable achievement that Henry's two educational foundations still exist. I, I mean, that is quite extraordinary. And I think also my favourite thing about Henry, my favourite fact that's sort of been forgotten in his story is he's remembered as being a rubbish king but we forget about his whole sainthood element to him. More than 300 miracles were ascribed to him after he had died, you know, saving children from plague, saving people from drowning, saving people even from being hanged to death for crimes they didn't commit. And I think that is an extraordinary testament to someone who, as I said, was not an effective king, but who clearly had some sort of common touch or ability with people to, to make them feel love for him. And I think it's such a shame that someone who could engender that much affection wasn't able to kind of have the charisma or whatever it is to use that to make himself the king he needed to be. I think that is a really great testament to the fact that we need to look at history in terms of people and not in yeah. terms of figureheads. And I think that that's really a great way that you've looked at Henry to really get at what he was up against and how we shouldn't look at him as somebody who is only his illness, but as somebody who had a full life as well. As tragic as it was at moments, he did have quite a full life. Yes. I mean, too full. Hence, the book is huge. <laughs> <laughs> the book is huge, but it's worth the read. It is. It's huge, but also very readable. <laughs> yes. And That's what I'd say. And I do. I think it's worth giving you some some props for the fact that you have a lot of family trees and maps at the beginning, which makes it a lot easier in the Wars of the Roses when everyone is either Henry, Richard, or Edward. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm now working on um, a book about Margaret Beaufort, and oh my goodness, every single person she was related to is called Margaret. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's ridiculous. I know. I Positive often there. I often have to take a minute and, and think to myself, okay, Margaret of Anjou, Margaret of Beaufort, they're both two two different people overlapping, not the same person at all. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this book, is it going to be a biography of Margaret? Yes. Yeah. So it's a biography of Margaret Beaufort. Hopefully what I want to do is put her a bit more into the context of her times, because I think she has been held up as this peculiar sort of tiger mom figure for her son, Henry VII, the first Tudor king, and seen as sort of outside of her time slightly. And actually what I want to do is look at her, particularly in relation to the other women who are around in the 15th century and what they're going through to, to make sense of, just as I tried to do with Henry, just to make sense of why she is the way she is and how she manages, in her case, to achieve a lot during her life. So yeah, you're going to be knee deep in Margaret's for a while. <laughs> when is yes. that book looking to come out? Well, hopefully late 2021, slightly dependent on if I can ever get back into a library or an archive. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, fingers crossed that is very soon. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for talking to us about Henry VI. I really appreciate your time and the way that you actually look at this king that's so often forgotten. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been good to talk about him. To find out more about Lauren's work, you can follow her on Twitter at history underscore Lauren. You can also check out her webpage at lauren-johnson.com. That's Johnson with an H. Her book, Shadow King, The Life and Death of Henry VI, 
is available now at bookstores everywhere. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new, Peter? Hey, hey, uh, there's a lot new, actually, in the medieval world. Uh, last week or so, there's a Viking ship being excavated in Norway, and it's the first time in, in over 100 years that they're digging one out of the ground. That looks like it's going to be a, a whole ship, although it's probably a bit damaged, a bit uh, decomposed, but uh, it's an exciting find that uh, just kind of started last week, and it'll be going for about six months. So we'll kind of follow along on that. We also welcome Catherine Walton to the uh, team on a website. Uh, she's going to be looking at medieval peasants. So one of the two columnists we're having on that uh, on that topic, her first piece was about charms and uh, medieval farming. So what to do if your cows get loose. <laughs> That's always good to know. I'm looking forward to reading that one. <laughs> so yeah, we have a, a busy week on the website. And I'm looking forward uh, also to uh, more podcasts and fun summer. <laughs> thanks sounds awesome peter thanks thank you to all of our patrons on patreon.com for all of your generosity if you're new to the podcast and enjoying it why not check out our patreon page where you can find sweet deals on medieval warfare magazine the medieval magazine and our very own book club it's your support that makes it possible to keep this podcast on the air so thank you i hope you're loving your magazines and your books you can find all the awesomeness at patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from the Wars of the Roses to the Mongol Empire, follow medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabelski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at all your favorite bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening. Have yourself an amazing day. <laughs> <laughs>